Okay, last section in research methodology, methodological pluralism and methodological purism. This is page 65. So far in this book, we have suggested that there is a strong relationship between positivism and quantitative methods on the one hand and interactionism and qualitative methods on the other. This division is real in sociology, marking a real debate, as Martin Hammersley acknowledges. While positivists... No, sorry, while positivist social scientists have themselves varied somewhat in their interpretations of science, in general they have taken quantitative measurement and the experimental or statistical manipulation of variables as its key elements. And it is against this conception of scientific methods that anti-positivists in the social sciences have rebelled most strongly, often advocating instead the use of qualitative methods. Okay, so all the things we've talked about already. Behind this statement lies the argument that the use of a particular method or method aligns the researcher with a particular view of what the world is like and how the study of society should be carried out, given the researcher's real aim of generating theory. Okay, nothing new here. Triangulation. Increasingly, as we have argued at the beginning of this chapter, sociologists are prepared to drop this division in favour of simply doing sociology, using whatever methods are appropriate, whether quantitative or qualitative. At the same time, they do not seek to call themselves positivists or interactionists, but simply sociologists. Okay, so as I was saying in the in the last recording, um, that you know, at the end of the day, if you're a sociologist, does it matter what theory you use or what label you give to yourself? This approach is called methodological pluralism, or sometimes using Norman Denzine's term triangulation. Thus, sociologists are willing to use a range of methods, whilst at the same time refusing to have themselves simplistically pigeonholed as belonging to one or other of the perspectives in sociology. And of course, this is the irony of sociology, that sociology talks about labelling theories and self-fulfilling prophecies, and yet here people are trying to pigeonhole sociologists. As early as 1957, Trow argued that we should be done with the arguments of participant observation versus interviewing and get on with the business of attacking our problems with the widest array of conceptual and methodological tools that we possess and they demand. Okay, so this is the idea of when you're going to con conduct some research, what are going to be the best methods to find out what it is that you are researching about. A good example of a response to such a challenge of methodological pluralism was provided by Howard Gans in The Levitt Owners, where his main method was participant observation achieved by buying a house in Levittown, USA. He also, however, sent out 3,100 questionnaires to people about to move to Levittown and conducted structured interviews with a smaller sample of Levittown residents, repeated after two years. Gans was thus prepared to use a range of methods in order to discover what it was like to move to and live in Levittown. Okay, so here we can see a mixture of methodologies. Disciplinary ethnocentrism. Researchers such as Gans have few qualms about combining quantitative and qualitative data, believing that there would be no corresponding loss of theoretical rigour and coherence. For this to continue, what Warwick calls disciplinary ethnocentrism will have to come to an end. Many quantitative social scientists, he argues, fancy themselves as hardheads, true scientists, whose propensity for numbers betokens a deep and undying commitment to truth. Those who do not share this faith are softheads, who do not deserve the name of science. For their part, social scientists of a qualitative persuasion often portray their approach as humane, sensitive, intuitive and comprehensive. Quantitative researchers, by contrast, are methodologically gross, insensitive to context and more often than not wrong in their assessment of community dynamics. Okay, so, you know, here it kind of makes sociologists look a bit pathetic. They're just having a big argument, we're better than you. Uh, you know, they need to just grow up and actually start sharing because sharing is caring. At the heart of this debate concerning the reliability and validity of types of data in sociology is the question of the status of the sociology produced through the employment of these methods. Purists, sociologists at either end of the spectrum, will remain convinced that their unadulterated perspective will produce either the most reliable or valid information about the nature of human organisation. Positivists will continue to see their work as a contribution to scientific knowledge. 
Given Durkheim's aim of developing a science of society, it is hard, for example, to see him using anything other than quantitative methods in his study of suicide. Phenomenologists will continue to raise fundamental objections to the way such data seems to fail to describe people and the societies they live in. The danger of methodological pluralism may well be the creation of a generation of sociologists who are competent in everything and proficient in nothing. Okay, now if you want to take an analogy from the world of literature, let's look at Harry Potter. Okay, Harry Potter is a pure blood ma uh, magician, wizard. Okay, whereas in the books, the person who is the truly strong wizard is a mudblood, Hermione. Now, if that's the case, then if you look at this, this would suggest that combining the two is the best thing to do rather than staying pure to one side. Okay, and in the same way that we now look at ourselves and we say, okay, am I a citizen of a country or am I a citizen of the world? Okay, because everything is open to us more. All right, now, obviously there, that final argument is that you may be you know, a, um, a jack of all trades and a master of none. Okay, so good at lots of little things, but nothing as a whole. Okay, and this is where purists always want to stay. You, again, as a sociology student, have to decide which you think is the better way of doing things. Is it best to pick one approach and stick to that? Or is it a good idea to combine a few approaches uh, to, to uh add extra depth maybe to what you are doing and to look at it from different perspectives.